we had before. So um, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce our second lecturer of the day, Nigel Cooper from University of Cambridge. Nigel works at the interface of is a theorist working at the interface between condensed matter physics and ultracolatoms. He has great intuition on ultracolatoms and has done a lot of connections between the two fields. So it's a great pleasure to have him today uh, following up Tillman's great lecture by Tillman. So, and he's going to tell us about topological phases of matter and dynamics. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, it's a well, pleasure to be part of this and to be able to uh, uh, contribute to this, even if it is uh, remote. Um, so, uh, so indeed, um, so I'm going to, uh, so the lectures I'm going to do give are about um, the role of topology in quantum many body systems. Uh, and as uh, many, if not all of you know, this is a, an area that's extremely active in solid state systems and has also been very active in cold gases for good reasons that the cold gases um, really offer lots of opportunities to explore interesting aspects of topological quantum many body systems. Um, new physical situations where you can control the lattice geometry symmetries and uh, things which are difficult to, difficult to control in um, solid state. Uh, possible uh, phases of strongly interacting bosons, which are unusual in solid state systems, and also uh, introducing controlled dissipation, um, as uh, Sebastian Deal has uh, been talking about. Um, but there are also you know, other ways that you can probe the system to uncover, to do experiments in different ways than you could do in, in uh, solid state systems. And, uh, and key uh, among all of this is that in, in cold gases, you have the access to the full quantum dynamics. So uh, that raises a lot of interesting questions about the dynamical aspects of quantum many body systems. So, um, so it's, it's an enormous topic. Um, uh, clearly, there's no way I can cover all of it in any uh, sensible uh, way. So, um, so in these lectures, um, what I'm planning to do is to give a, a very introductory uh, presentation. So it's uh, this is not aimed at the experts, and I'm sure there are plenty of experts in the audience, uh, also among the students. Uh, so this is not uh, the, the, the series of lectures for you. It's really aimed at those who are not as experts in the area, but who are somewhat interested and may may want to know how, how these things connect to uh, experiments in uh, cold gases. Now I'm since I'm a theorist and we have uh, amazing experimentalists uh, as part of this uh, series, I'm not going to tr uh, try and explain specific experimental implementations. Uh, we have uh, Tillman uh, is doing that uh, much better than I ever could. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, th the underlying theory, uh, but trying to give a fairly non-technical account of that so that there's some intuition, uh, or maybe you can gain some intuition from the equations that I write down. Uh, so it's, it's going to be uh, guided uh, by what's been done in cold atoms and also uh, focusing on those aspects that uh, I think uh, are most interesting to explore in cold atoms. So that's the uh, sort of wordy uh, overview. Uh, let me see. Uh, the, um, uh, so the, the, the overview uh, for the lectures I, I've written here. So I have this, uh, much of it will be uh, just talked about the topological phase, an introduction to topological phases of uh, quantum matter equilibrium. Uh, topological band theory, uh, symmetry protection, and I'll say some words about uh, what happens when you have strong interactions. And then I'll talk about dynamical effects, um, uh, pumping, uh, flocket topology, and uh, systems that are far from equilibrium uh, undergoing a unitary evolution. So, uh, so this is uh, much of what I'm going to say is, is work that uh, is reviewed in this paper, um, this, this article that um, I wrote with uh, Jean Dalibar and Ian Spielman, uh, and the, um, the things that I'll talk about in the far from equilibrium topological uh, systems is work that was uh, in collaboration with Marcello uh, Cao, um, Joe Bassin, Gunnar Moller, and uh, Max McGinley. And it's, it's a pleasure to acknowledge all of the, uh, um, the great input that all of these people give uh, to my understanding, uh, as well as uh, many other people that I've worked with over the years in these, in these topics who I haven't explicitly mentioned here. Okay, so that's where, where we're going. Probably the first two lectures, um, we'll probably take the first two lectures to cover the first point of topological phases of matter, and then the third lecture will mostly be dynamical effects, I imagine, but we'll see how it goes. And, um, and as, as ever, uh, well, as, as we stated beforehand, please, please do interrupt. I, 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 I'll try and keep an eye on the chat if, if things appear 
Um, but uh, please just jump in and ask questions if you have any questions. Okay, so uh, so let's make a start. And so I'm going to uh, start by uh, talking about uh, topological band theory. Oh, and uh, perhaps just to say that my, my plan is to do uh, as much as possible of this just uh, handwritten in this way. So that uh, will keep it uh, at a reasonable speed, um, but it may not be very clear in terms of my handwriting. So you, uh, I encourage you to take your own notes as well, uh, but I'll, um, you know, th these notes will be available a bit afterwards for you to, to look at and try and uh, decrypt. So, so this is a topic that's been reviewed uh, many times by uh, the experts who funded the subject. Uh, you can, um, so if you want uh, in-depth reviews, you should look at uh, there's a review article by uh, Hassan and Kane, which was in the Red Mod Fizz from 2010, or uh, uh, Xi and Zhang from Red Mod Fizz uh, in 2011. Uh, and the, um, the point is to uh, explain the understanding that uh, 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 block energy bands can be characterized by topological invariants. So the first thing to explain is what we mean by a topological invariant. And the, the standard uh, pictorial uh, uh, example of this is of uh, uh, two-dimensional surfaces and three-dimensional space, where one uh, says that one has an invariant, the genus of the surface, uh, which is, for example, different if you have a sphere of genus zero, or a donut of genus one, and we can't smoothly uh, convert a sphere into a donut without puncturing the surface. Now that's a, a clear example of a topological invariant. I, I'd like to give uh, one other example, which is a bit more um, familiar in uh, the context of cold atoms, which is a superfluid in a ring, in a trap of a, of a ring geometry. So here we have some ring, which um, is uh, the, the trap in a, um, like, a, like a donut. Uh, and in, inside this, we have a condensate with a wave function, which we can write as the square root of the density times e to the i times the phase, which can, both the density and phase can depend on position. And uh, we know that we can associate a topological invariant with this, which is the, the winding number of the phase, uh, which we uh, call nw, which we get by taking the integral of the gradient of the phase um, around some closed path, uh, where I have some path here, path P, uh, which will run around this uh, closed path P. So this uh, is a topological invariant. It, it is an integer. And that integer, uh, well, integer topological invariant And it, it can't change under uh, smooth deformations, just as we have this notion of smooth deformations of surfaces, we have to have some notion of what we mean to, under topology is what, how we deform the system. And here a smooth deformation is one uh, for which uh, we make sure that the density never vanishes on the path P. So we have a smooth deformation. Uh, if the density is never zero on the path of course, if the, you know, if the density were to vanish on the path, uh, then uh, the, um, this phase becomes ill-defined because we have zero times e to the i phi. The phase is just ill-defined, and so we can't, uh, this, this whole construction uh, falls apart. So, so that's, uh, uh, that, that's the situation in which we can say that there's a topological invariant associated with this superfluid state. Uh, and so it's a mathematical construction here. It counts the number of times the system uh, winds. As you know, it also it counts the number of quantum vortices inside this path. And it also has some physical consequences. In, in this case, if, uh, if the system is metastable, that is if there's an energy barrier for vortices to enter and to move through the ring, uh, which would cause uh, this uh, winding number to unwind if there's a um, if if that's energetically unfavorable then we can have um, we'll have metastable uh, persistent currents and the the value of this winding number will tell you the uh, the magnitude of the uh, of the uh, current around the ring okay so that's a uh, 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 introduction to this sort of, uh, 
a definition of what I mean by a topological invariant. Now we're going to uh, apply this to uh, block bands. So block bands, uh, which uh, correspond to a, a quantum particle moving in a periodic potential. So for example, imagine we have a one dimensional uh, uh, system with position X and we have a periodic uh, potential V of X, which is period with, uh, periodic with uh, a lattice constant A, uh, then we know that we get um, some uh, energy bands labeled by a block um, wave number, uh, which um, run over a Brillouin zone, in this case from minus, minus, from minus pi over A to pi over A, and we have some energies E as a function of Q, which are, let's say, look like this, some energy. And these, um, these energy bands, uh, let's say this is, these are energies E N of Q, um, in general, is, is a vector is the energy band E N. It's periodic in the uh, reciprocal lattice. So G is uh, one of the reciprocal lattice vectors. Here, uh, G is just two pi over A times an integer. And that's why we have uh, periodicity on, on, and two pi over A on, in this diagram. And I only draw the central section, the Brillouin zone for that. And the, the wave functions uh, take the block wave form that for the, the nth state, um, in, so n here labels which of these bands we're looking at, uh, the nth state um, is a plain wave state e to the i q r times some periodic function u, which depends on q, it depends on the band we're in, and it's a, a function of position. So this is periodic function. So these are, these are block states. And uh, in this case, so here, uh, the topological invariants that uh, we're interested in are uh, invariants that characterize the variation of these block states uh, as, uh, as the wave vector Q runs over the Brillouin zone. So here there are topological invariants uh, that characterize by um, UQ of N varies across the Brillouin zone. And uh, so then um, to make connection to what I said before, we have to say something about what we mean. Um, so there's gonna be some integers. Uh, we're, they're gonna be invariant under smooth deformations. We have to say what we mean by a smooth deformation. And here a smooth deformation uh, means that the bands uh, never touch. There are no gap closings. So these, each, each band uh, remains uh, uh, clearly defined at each point in, in, in in wave vector space, so no gap closing, uh, and there will also be physical consequences if we make a band insulator that um, that fills uh, you know we fill one one or several of these bands with uh, with fermions, so we have an insulating uh, system. Uh, the um, there can be physical uh, consequences of the topological. Uh, nature of the bands, uh, and the, the key one is that they're in, in the systems that we're focusing on, uh, there are gapless edge states. So even though there's a gap, the, the energy, we, we, ins we insist insisted that there is a gap in the spectrum in order to define that we have a, uh, can have a topological phase and uh, to define our notion of a smooth deformation, but e even if the bulk system has got a gap, then there'll be a, a surface state that is uh, gapless. And there can also be situations where uh, there is a quantized, uh, there are quantized response functions, uh, like, um, uh, like the system responds to external perturbations. Okay, so that uh, sets the um, uh, background of, of what, what we want to uh, understand and to, do, uh, and to um, characterize.
So the, the, the way that um, uh, this is done and the way that I want to present this um, uh, makes a lot of use of the uh, notion of the berry fields. So I want to write one page reminding you of the berry fields. Um, Uh, and here, uh, what we want to think about is that we have some Hamiltonian, which depends on some parameters, a set of parameters are just labeled by a vector uh, capital X, which uh, you know, these are just some large number or, or some countable number of, um, of parameters that control uh, the Hamiltonian of the system. And we'll have a state psi, um, which depends on X, which is an eigenstate. And of course, its energy eigenvalue will depend on what the Hamiltonian is, which depends on x, uh, and there'll be some psi x. And so we have some, you know, as a function of you know, some coordinate uh, x1, one of these, uh, we'll have, we have um, energies which, uh, which can wander around. One, two, three, and so on. I guess I should have put indices here to label the different states. Uh, and what we want to think about, and uh, what Barry thought about, is the adiabatic evolution of the wave function. If you start in one of these states and you slowly change the parameters x, uh, slowly here meaning adiabatic, meaning that the characteristic frequencies that you uh, use, uh, in, uh, characteristic frequencies with which uh, x varies, are small compared to the gaps. So there's no there's no excitation from uh, one um, from the, the state that you're in into the uh, other states. So we have a diabatic evolution. Um, and uh, here uh, I'm actually going to consider a situation where we uh, change the parameters x and come back to where we started from. So we'll, uh, we'll have x as a function of t and it will, it will evolve over a cycle. Uh, from t equals zero to some final time t, uh, where, um, where x at zero equals x of t. So pictorially, let me just draw it here. Let's imagine I plot x1 and x2. Uh, then I have, I have some, you know, start at some initial time uh, t0 at some point here. And as time varies, uh, we, I move in parameter space. And at the cap time capital t, I get back to where I started from. So uh, the um, uh, result of uh, Berry is to, is to explain uh, how the wave function evolves as uh, how, what the wave function is at the end of this adiabatic uh, process. And uh, the answer is, um, is quite simple, but uh, very pretty, which is that, well, we know, we know that uh, the, the Hamiltonian has come back to the Hamiltonian that we started from. So the and the energy eigenstate has, uh, has to come back to the state that we started from. It was non-degenerate, I should have emphasized, the non-degenerate spectrum to start with. Uh, and so uh, all that can happen is that um, at the end of the cycle, psi n of x, whatever we started with, has to go back to psi n of x, the same function, but it will have picked up a phase and the phase has got two pieces. It has a, the dynamical part, integral from zero to t, of the instantaneous energy en of x at time t prime and t prime. That's just the phase accumulation due to the instantaneous energy, and uh, which depends on the rate at which the uh, process occurs. And then there's a uh, term which is uh, geometrical, the, uh, the Berry phase, uh, which uh, does not depend on the uh, on the rate at which you move. It just depends on the geometry of the path. So this uh, geometrical phase. Um, get my notation straight. It's e, for each band n. There's gamma geometrical, uh, which is um, the can be written as the line integral around this loop of um, the uh, Berry connection scalar product of x. So this is uh, this, so this defines a, a a vector in the uh, in this parameter space of um, x1, x2, and so on. Uh, which is given the very so-called Berry connection, given by the x the overlap of psi n with the derivative of psi n. The Berry connection. 
uh, or uh, equivalent. I have a question. Yeah, of course, please. Um, so the Hamiltonian here, it, can it be a many body Hamiltonian in addition to a single body Hamiltonian? Like, would this still apply and you could get like a many body Berry phase? Uh, absolutely. So, so, I mean, so what, what I'm writing on this, uh, what I'm writing on this, um, uh, on this slide is is completely general, and uh, it could be states psi of x could be many body states, and indeed this is this is relevant for situations like in the fractional quantum Hall effect. You could have a Hamiltonian where x, uh, you, know, you could have a Hamiltonian where you grab hold of some quasi-particles and the positions at which you grab hold of them are your parameters, which are in, in X. And then you adiabatically move your, these uh, quasi-particles around and the, you get back to the state you started from, but there the Berry phase or part of the Berry phase would uh, tell you that these are actually any ions. The phase that's picked up it could be some non-trivial um, uh, phase that tells you that the this many-body state had element had these quasi-particles that actually had any on statistics. So that would be a, 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 a an interesting and important way in which uh, a many-body Berry phase would have a, a, a direct uh, physical consequence. Here, you know, so so this you know, what I'm writing here is extremely general. I'm going to apply it for band theory where um, where, X, where it's going to be a single particle problem, and x is going to be uh, the, um, the, the wave vector. So we're going to think of the parameters x as being the space of wave vectors. And there, in that case, it's going to be explicitly a single particle uh, application of this, um, uh, of this uh, theory. But, the, but as written here, uh, th this is entirely general. OK. And for the case with the anions you mentioned, you would probably be considering something like the ground state which is gapped away from the excited states. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, so there, that, but you that could also much... apply it to like bands, like many body bands in the middle too, if you wanted. You could, you, you just, I mean, it, the, I mean, the difficulty is that if you're in the middle of the spectra, it, I mean, you need to have a, uh, you need to be gapped above and below. You don't want to have any crossings. And if you, you know, in, in, co in complex many body systems, the further you've got the spectrum, the denser the levels can get. And so typically, typically, uh, in order to have a, a state, you know, a non-degenerate state that's nicely separated from other things and that you don't get non-negative uh, um, corrections, you usually you want to be at the, either the top or the bottom of the energy spectrum. But, but that's, there's nothing fundamental about that. That's a, that's a statement about under what conditions you can get, you can meet the criteria to be adiabatic. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so that's um, so. Um, but we can write it another way, uh, which is to use Stokes' theorem and write the line integral by the integral over the surface that's bounded by that line. And uh, so we can also write this uh, geometrical or Berry phase as an integral over the uh, over the uh, two-dimensional surface uh, bounded by it, uh, which uh, I'll just write as a, a curl if it is explicitly a two-dimensional system. Um, the curl, term, the, the, the surface normal, um, where uh, and here we introduce a quantity that will come up again later. It's a vector here in the space, the omega of n, which is uh, the curl of, of the uh, Berry connection. So this, and this is, this is known as a Berry curvature. So, so as I said, uh, it, I'm going to apply this in, in these lectures uh, to the case where we have just one body, one body um, uh, energy bands. Uh, X will be, um, we're gonna use the wave vector Q um, for, the, for the band. And essentially the, the, the usefulness of this is that this Berry connection, the Berry curvature, they, they describe um, local geometrical properties of the block states, and they can be used to construct these topological invariants about, about, uh, which tell you how the, um, the block wave functions are, um, are, are, are twisting or, or uh, Contorted in the uh, in the Brillouin zone. Okay, so um, in order to uh, make progress, I, I want to I want to go through uh, uh, an example, which um, uh, is fairly canonical example uh, of the uh, Sue Schrieffer Heger model. So this is a one D model. Sue Schrieffer. Actually, ask a question before you jump into this. Yeah, of course, please. 
So in a couple of cold atom experiments that I can think of, um, people have done interferometric measurements of Dirac points where they see um, for loops around the Dirac point in a honeycomb lattice, uh, picking up a pi barrier phase. Um, so I think like in my mind, I've been loosely thinking about that as being associated with some kind of winding number, but that's the situation where bands touch. And uh, so in this definition of a topological invariant, you're saying bands aren't supposed to touch. Like how, how is that kind of winding number different than the yeah. kind of winding number you're talking about here? No, so, so that that's that's so so that's a yeah it's a great question thanks so so there um, so that's a situation if you, if you take a you know a state and you and you make an adiabatic evolution around around this band closing point around the direct point then that's a situation where you have adiabatic evolution at all points because it's gapped in the region where you are there's a gap and um, you never go close to the direct point uh, and so you can um, you can certainly Compute the integral, let's say the integral of the Berry connection around that, and you'll get you'll get a pi. You get a phase of pi in that case, and that's and that is um, robust and topological in the sense that as you deform that loop, it's not as long as you don't cross the Dirac point, it will it will remain pi. So that that's a perfectly valid and accurate topological characterization of one aspect of the band structure. So there you're you're, you're you're characterizing a particular path in the band structure. What, what I was um, saying, if you want to characterize, uh, put a topological invariant on the entire band, that's a different story. So that would explore every point in the Brillouin zone. Here you're, you're um, de de defining a, a quantity that explores a subset of the points in the Brillouin zone. And that subset is always gapped, so that's, that's fine, but it's not the topological invariant for the band, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a, um, a topological invariant for a you know for a particular class of ex you know, interferometric experiment or it's for a particular measurement. So so they're connected, but but the, the difference is just that. I, and I say I want the bands to be separate everywhere because we're going to we're going to characterize the entire band, not just not just a trajectory. I see. Thanks. Are there other I questions. Maybe it's uh, also useful to say that uh, the example about you know, that you mentioned like Dirac point versus this example. Uh, one is topological in the sense of, uh, you know, the flux, the berry flux is only confined to a little region while here it could be spread out uh, in what you're doing. So it could be, you know, the flux could be going through entire Berlin zone. So then it's, that's why I, th I think that's why you're calling it geometrical as opposed to topological phase. Is that fair? Um, so, so the yeah, so the the um, yeah the geometrical part is that it depends only on the geometry of the you know of the path. So that's the so and indeed, um, I mean the, the distinction you're, you're drawing, Leo, is is between uh, the direct point. So the direct point is is a case is a situation where there's no Berry curvature. So you can accept that this at this one singular point, right? Right. That, that's why you can deform. Uh, you can basically you can de you can deform this path any way that you like, as long right. as it doesn't cross the, the, that point. And as you deform it, uh, it you, you maintain the same topological invariant. So it's it's um, it's a special case where there's no um, geometry. That's there's a there's a point like singularity. There's no ge there's no geometry in the states other than at that point, so that's right. that's why you have this freedom to move it around. Right. But in the case where there's a very curvature, and you know, it'd be like this Dirac point is is broadened, and there can be local very curvature. Then actually, it matters where what the path is. It's right. still yeah. So so it's um, yeah. And I'm just yeah trying to emphasize the distinction between topological phase versus uh, geometrical phase. Well, I, I wouldn't. So, so I think the distinction I, I'd make here is about whether it's a phase or not. So, so, it, so the, if we make an interferometric measurement of that of that quantity, that's not a phase of matter. That's a that's a measurement of a right of a, of a feature of an energy band, and you can measure with one particle, and it's a it, you know, it's a it's an um, it's uh, a topological invariant for that band structure, but it's not a phase of matter. But for the um, these topo these phases 
where we, we take, say, a band insulator and we fill the band with, with non-interacting fermions, mm -hmm. that is a phase of matter in the sense that it's, it's a, um, uh, there's a, you have a macroscopic number of particles and it has, um, uh, it's, it's, there's a, it's distinct from um, other topological states of that macroscopic number of particles. So, so I would, so you can have you know, topology and geometry for particular quantities and individual particles and, and, and make use of these things in many ways. But the, uh, the distinction I'd make is the, um, uh, is the, um, uh, the, whether it's a phase, uh, to be a phase, it's a many particle system. Yeah, I didn't mean phase in the sense of phase of matter. I meant topological phase as in the phase of a wave function, you know, phase, topological phase versus geometrical phase of, you know, of, you know, in the sense that you define the gamma. Anyway, yeah, okay. I mean, I would still say that it's, topo it's a topological, you know, that phase is topological invariant in the sense that you can make smooth deformations on the, on the path and it's, and it's yeah. fixed. No, it's, it's, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so I, I wanted uh, to talk about this SSH, the Sushri for Heger model in, in 1D, um, which is introduced as a, a model of uh, polyacetylene, um, but that is a, what one can use as a, a nice way to motivate a, a class of uh, topological um, uh, uh, topological insulators. So the um, so the picture. Well, one way you could realize this, and it, you know, one way it has been realized in cool gases. Is to um, is to make a, a sort of super lattice potential. So we have V of X in one dimension. Um, and let, let me try and make this a bit neater. So we have, um, and we're going to make a super lattice with minima. Uh, so the minimum here and the maximum, another minimum here. Something like this. So, so this is uh, something where uh, the, the lattice constant is at this position is zero. The lattice constant is uh, this distance, okay, because that's where the, the periodicity of the lattice. Uh, and we have these um, um, uh, minima. And in order to, and, and so it's a periodic system, we have blocks there and we can get uh, 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 block states. But in order to make connection to something that's topological, we have to uh, reduce this to a tight binding model. And so to do that, we'll think about. So the lattice is deep enough that we can expand the wave function in terms of uh, localized orbitals around these minima. So this one called phi a of x, this one called phi b of x. And then these are the same things, but they're displaced phi a of x minus a. And this is phi b of x minus a and so on. Okay, so we have a set of these orbitals that are displaced by a. And so we want to make a, we make a tight binding model Where we expand the wave function psi as a sum over uh, the unit cells of some amplitudes to be on the A site, A sub J, sorry, B of J, B sub J. So here, uh, th th this is the, uh, the sort of the ket uh, representation. Well, if I, if I make the position representation of that, it corresponds to this function phi A and similarly X sub J, X sub J. So in this type binding model, the, the block wave, um, we can write um, psi q, psi q, some n. Actually, I, I, I think in the next part, I'm just going to suppress the, the index n because uh, I know just to know, know that there are different there are different levels we could look at. But it's um, it's the case where the these uh, amplitudes are periodic uh, with wave vector Q. So we can take out a spatially dependent part E to the I Q A J. So A J is the, is the position of the unit cell labeled by the integer J, you know, J of zero, one, two, and so on, or these uh, unit cells offset by A. Uh, and then it's multiplied by a function U A Q A J plus B of Q E J. And this function is periodic um, in J, like it's, it's, it's independent of 
uh, of J. Uh, sorry, it's independent of which unit cell you're in, so it's periodic uh, in space. And, I've, and as before, I've assumed periodic binding conditions. Okay, so that's that's our type binding with, and we um, can. Uh, the other thing we need to write down is what the Hamiltonian is, and uh, the Hamiltonian, um, the, the limit in which this uh, can act uh, as a topological system is where we restrict, we say that the tunneling between these is only between nearest neighbors. So we have some tunneling between the two sites within the unit cell, uh, which we'll call J prime, and the tunneling between the two sites that go between unit cells that we'll call J. So the, um, so the Hamiltonian is minus J prime sum over J of something where we just interconvert with, um, from site from state AJ to DJ um, plus permission conjugate. And then there's uh, the term that goes between the sites, sum over J. And here, um, site BJ goes, uh, a BJ goes to AJ uh, minus one. So it goes between sites. So we have to have, so we have AJ minus one, BJ plus the permission conjugate. And uh, uh, yeah, you can check that this uh, that, that this uh, is a consistent uh, solution for that. Uh, I won't go through um, through the details, but I just write down the form of the um, uh, equations that you get. That you can you can compress the equations for these amplitudes um, u a e q into e q. Just by just substituting this thing in and taking the uh, taking the overlap with one of the with the site A and taking the overlap with the site B, we get equations for these amplitudes um, U A Q and U B Q, and we can write that uh, the, uh, if you get two sets of equations where you look at the amplitude on the A sites and the amplitude on the B sites, we can write those two equations as a two by two matrix where the Hamiltonian uh, is depends depends on wave vector and it takes the form minus j minus j into minus i q a minus j minus j into so, which uh, uh, has the feature that h of q is h of q plus two pi over a. So of course the uh, the spectrum is also periodic in two pi over a. Okay, so um, so we can uh, so we have this. Uh, um, uh, Hamiltonian, we can compute the uh, the energy spectrum. Uh, it's convenient. Um, it's convenient to write this as h q is minus h to vector h of q scalar product of the Pauli matrices. So I write this as zero to minus zero h x minus i h y. Which has plus a, which has zero, and um, uh, where which x plus i which one is j prime a, and we'll write this as its magnitude and its phase in phi phi q. So uh, just uh, uh, writing in terms of these variables, uh, amplitude and phase, we can get the energy spectrum, and the spectrum is. Um, okay. the spectrum is the EQ for the two bands plus or minus or plus or minus the magnitude. Uh, uh, and if we plot those, well, they're, they're of the form that I sketched before. Minus pi over A. Okay. And the, the, the block wave functions of u to a, u to b, one, u to one, and one to plus, u to the i, u to fix. So, um, okay, so, it's, so we have this uh, simple form for the um, energy spectrum and for the wave function. And if we, um, uh, if we put one fermion, Unit cell. So that means that we, we fill 
and we look at the brown state, and so we fill this lowest band, then uh, there's, a, there's a band gap, uh, at least as long as this gap doesn't close, uh, so we have a band in silicon, uh, at least for um, the case where J is not equal to J prime. If J does equal J prime, then actually if J equals J prime, then when QA is pi, this is uh, um, this is minus one and J prime minus J is zero, so mod H is zero. So the band cap, uh, the band gap closes here. Um, gap closes. J equals J prime. Okay, so this um, so this is um, this is our band insulator, but it's one where we can uh, um, it, it can actually show a topological phase, um, and uh, uh, for which we can construct a topological invariant. And in this case, uh, in the way things have been set up, we can um, construct a topological invariant from what's known as the, the Zach phase. Topological variant from the Zach phase. Um, introduced as a way right, can I ask you a question? So, yeah, of course, please. If, if I have just a two level system uh, with two displaced bands, so one has cos Ka and the other has cos Ka plus phi with some flux, uh, this is I mean, somehow reproduces very similar the band structure that you you get, yes. But or do you need any extra extra? So if can I see the lowest band like a cos k and the upper band like if some shifted plus displaced band and that's it, or there is an extra extra structure that I have to include? Well, you you, you could see it that way, but there there is an extra structure here which is in the block wave function. So. So that so just matching this, the energy spectrum. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that you know, that's a, a useful and important question. That you know, before this story of topological bands, people were used to looking at band structures and just getting seeing the spaghetti. And they would characterize the band structure by plotting the energy eigenvalues as a function of Q. But yeah. actually, the topological um, the notion of topological insulators has told us that it's not enough just to know the energies. We also need to know the wave functions and how those wave functions vary as we go across the um, the uh, real one zone. So you could you could very well mimic exactly this uh, in some other situation, exactly this energy spectrum, but the the bands could have completely different uh, block wave functions and would therefore not show the features that are associated with topological insulators like surface states and I so see. on. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, so we, it's all in the non-trivial file, right? It's all in the non-trivial, trivial or non-trivial phi of Q of yeah. the wave function that you wrote, of the spin that you drew, yeah. That's right, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so so here we're gonna, in this 1D case, we construct it from this phase, uh, uh, the Zach phase, uh, which is uh, just defined as the integral of the Berry curvature, uh, so, uh, Q, Sorry, the Berry connection. So this is uh, over the Bruin zone. So this is over the Bruin zone. I mean, from minus pi over a to pi over a. This is the Berry connection. And this, uh, so this is the Berry phase accumulated in crossing the Bruin zone. And this, um, it, remember that we we set up, we've set up a Hamiltonian where h h of q is h of q plus Two pi over a, so the Hamiltonian is periodic. So this is precisely a situation where we can think of the um, doing this sort of Berry type adiabatic um, evolution, where the Hamiltonian comes back to itself at the at the end of the cycle. And we compute here. We compute the the, the, the Berry phase for that process, but it's the exact phase which suggests suggest this is a way to characterize energy bands. Well, let, let's calculate it directly for this uh, SSH model. So here. Model. Uh, we can just calculate it. Uh, we know what the wave functions are. Uh, you can, you know, so we, yeah, the wave function of the spinner, is, as Leo said, we take the derivative with respect to Q, we get a, a d phi Q by dQ, which we need to put in, and the, um, we get an integral over the Brewing zone of d phi Q by dQ dQ. Uh, but this thing, 
this thing is just like the, the winding number I, I wrote down on the first page about the topological invert, which was the, the superfluid. The winding number of the superfluid is went around the ring. This thing is just the same story. It's the change in phase, and it's the change in, 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 the, um, um, uh, in the, the phase of the, uh, of the wave function is phi q as you, as you go from q of zero to two pi over n. So this is two pi times some winding number and w, uh, and um, yeah. So, uh, so, and then you can see that uh, this allows us in this case to, uh, uh, to uh, establish the existence of a topological invariant uh, for the system. Because if we think about, well, basically uh, either the phi q winds around the, um, you know, winds by two pi or it doesn't wind. And so, and if you go between them, it, it, you're forced to have a gap closing. So just to see how that emerges, let's uh, uh, think of, remember we, everything was controlled by this quantity um, hx plus i hy, which was a modulus of h times mti phi q. So let's plot hx plus i, the, the complex plane hx plus i hy. So that's what I'm drawing here, hx plus i hy. Uh, and then I can consider a case where, um, you know, as we change the uh, wave vector Q, um, this phase, you know, the H, HX and HY uh, evolve in some particular way. Uh, and remember here, this, this angle in the complex plane is this uh, phase phi Q. So if I have a situation like this, where as you run over the Brillouin zone, HX and HY um, uh, encircle the origin, then that's uh, the case where we have uh, uh, the Zach phase is minus pi, which is at two pi times one, you get minus pi. Uh, and this uh, this occurs whenever j prime is less than j. And this uh, this is what we'll associate with being topological. But uh, we could also have a situation where, well, in particular, if j prime is greater than j, then uh, the Zach phase is zero, because phi doesn't wind around the origin. The, the angle phi just, um, increases and decreases and it can, uh, there's no net accumulation. Uh, and so this is a non-topological. And, uh, and these two um, cases cannot be smoothly connected in the sense I said before, uh, without a, a, a gap collapsing, because if we try and connect them, we'll, we're, we, or if we deform the red circle into the blue one, we're, we're required for it to cross the origin. And if it crosses the origin, then mod h is zero and the energy gap closes. So this cannot be smoothly forms. Uh, oh, so it's smoothly connected. Okay. So yeah, there's um question yeah uh i is there an intuitive way to see why like j prime less than j is uh, winds around the origin and j prime greater than j doesn't wind as opposed to the other case like what yeah yeah sorry uh, th thanks a good question i i, let me, I should have i should have written out that this hx plus i h y is j prime plus j e to the i q a. Let me just check if it was signed right. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so here, um, yeah, so, so imagine that, um, yeah, so, so imagine if, if we set j equal to zero, then, then h, h x would be j prime and h y would be zero. So if j were equal to zero, that would correspond to uh, to drawing something on here where we just had a point at uh, at, at j prime. Right? So that's that would be the case where j, if j so this is here I'm drawing a case j equals zero. Okay, because as we change qa, uh, hx and hy don't change; they're just fixed at this point. But on the other hand, imagine we set um, let's say we set that um, uh, j prime equal to zero. So if j prime equals zero, then uh, we get rid of this term. Then we have hx plus ihy is just j times 
e to the i q a and actually that's just that's a that's a circle around the uh, the origin uh, so i would just get a circle of radius j so this would be j e to the i q a with j prime equals zero so so there you can you can see that if j prime is less than j you'll typically you know this well you're getting a circle here which is displaced by j and uh, and, uh, and whether it encircles the origin or not depends on whether it's displaced by more than its radius. Is that okay? Yeah, and I guess physically it's that J prime is the one that connect different, different oh, okay. so lattice sites as opposed to I, I, I show you, I'll show it a minute why, there, there is a subtlety here, there's definitely a subtlety here in, um, and an ambiguity even in how we define what is topological and not topological, um, because um, because we could have we could have chosen our unit cell in different ways. We could have chosen a different pair of sites to be the unit cell, and then that would call, give rise to a shift of the Zach phase by actually by multiples of pi. And so actually, the absolute value of the Zach phase is not um, itself physically meaningful. What we, what's um, the subtlety here is that the, the, it's the difference of the Zach phase that will be important. So, uh, so indeed, there's no, um, the, 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 there's no particular reason, um, except depend, you know, depending on the physical circumstance, you know, in the circumstance I'll show, it's, it's more natural to take this as, the, as, the, uh, as our unit cell, and then whether it's topological or non-topological arises as to whether this phase is non-zero or zero. So, but th thanks for the question. There is a, there's a really what we care, what we're going to care, physically what we care about are interfaces, like an edge state would be an edge between two different, two different phases. And that would be a boundary between a topological and a non-topological phase. And uh, so it's the difference of the Zach phase that would be physically relevant. Thanks. Okay, let me um, go on. So, um, Okay, so I, I want to make a comment about uh, with this, you know, as well as being an example of uh, topology, it's an example of symmetry protection. Which is an important uh, topic in this field. Uh, so again, thinking of the Hamiltonian H of Q is minus H of Q dot the poly matrices. Um, then, so in general, you know, we could, Imagine that H, this vector H has got three components, Hx, Hy, and Hz for the three poly matrices, but we have a particular case where Hz is zero. And that's, that's why we had this feature that mu q plus minus uh, was given by one over u2, one um, minus plus mu phi phi q. So if we, if we plot this uh, on a block sphere, uh, for representing this two-level system, you know, where there's um, the, the z-axis um, is the basis that we're using uh, here, then um, th these, these states um, that we're looking at always lie on the equator. So in the case where uh, j, in the non-topological case, um, the non-topological case, you know, the, this uh, phi just sort of didn't wind around, and this was, this was the case j, prime greater than j, but in the other case, um, where we had a winding, where we had a winding, then we had something that looked like this. So this was j prime less than j. Uh, and um, the, it's clear that we can't smoothly connect these um, because we're, uh, they're forced to lie in the equator. But if we, um, uh, so, this, so this is a, a constraint and it comes about that because hz is zero, which is uh, a, a, a constraint uh, imposed on the Hamiltonian, uh, which um, is referred to as a either a chiral or sublattice symmetry. Um, then, um, then we can't uh, connect the two things together. So one can write this. Essentially, you can show that because uh, the the, the um, Sigma Z poly matrix uh, anti commutes with the Hamiltonian. Uh, then we have this uh, particular symmetry, which uh, forces this to be um, to lie in the in the equatorial plane, and then allows us to have a topological um, uh, quantum number. Uh, 
Now I say sublattice symmetry and this chiral symmetry comes about because we only had uh, hopping from site A to site B, there were no energy offsets. And we would break this if we put in some energy offsets uh, or tunneling from A to A directly or B to B directly. But if, let's say we just had some energy offsets and we would have some term like you know, delta epsilon times sigma Z and the Hamiltonian would no longer anti-commute um, with the sigma Z. Uh, and in a situation like that, then uh, you can def you'll deform the, the uh, lowest energy states will be deformed out of the plane. So it could, you could start getting something here. This is what said is non-zero. And then when one, could, when one could smoothly connect the, um, the red and the blue curves if you allow uh, it said to be non-zero because you can pull the loop over the, over the nearest pole. So this is a, a characteristic or a feature that shows that this is a symmetry protected topological phase. We only have a well-defined topological invariant um, when we have the symmetry, this constraint, uh, this chiral sublattice symmetry. So this is a, an example. Symmetry protected topological phase. Does it matter how much we break the symmetry as it if the sigma z term is like very small? Well, you know, it, if one's talking about topology, it's, it's a point of principle. And, and it's, um, so the, the, there's, no, there's no clear distinction between these. You know, you, you could, you, um, so there's no clear distinction between them. The, of course, in practice, you know, nothing is ever strictly zero. And in practice, there's always, you know, if, if perturbations are weak enough, then they'll have a small effect. So I, I, in this case, as I'll, I'll, I'll show, the, or as I'll state, the, um, the, the effects, the, one, of the, you know, one of the topological features here is the existence of a, a gapless surface state between two, the topological, non-topological phase. And the, the key thing is that uh, because of the symmetry, that, gap, that surface state will be exactly at zero energy or exactly in the middle of the gap. Now, if you had a small, if you had small symmetry breaking perturbations, then it will move slightly away. But you know, but strictly, it's no longer you know, strictly mathematically, it's it's no longer uh, in the symmetry protected phase because it's, there's no symmetry there. But of course, in practice, it, it's good enough. Like you know, many things are good enough. Or, or of course, here you know, in, in practice, you know, the, this super lattice potential is not really a tight binding model. We're we're making an assumption that we're neglecting other terms. Of course, they're also there. So strictly speaking, the super lattice is not a topological. It doesn't have the symmetries to be in a topological phase. Um, it's only in this sort of um, model where we, we've abstracted and reduced it to the type binding model, where it's a, a, um, we say it's strictly is of that type. But uh, but the, you know, the deviations, um, if the if, if it's if the deviations of Hamiltonian are small, then the, the physical consequences will be as, as small as well. Thanks. Nigel, yeah, I also. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. Sure, please. Um, so just to understand this right, as soon as I have some sort of coupling to say an H, H Z term, I, I, I cannot distinguish between the two phases anymore, like just from topological invariance. Is, is, is that what you're saying here? Strictly speaking, they, they are, they're, not, um, they're not topologically distinct because I could smoothly, you know, I could, I could then, you say that this if z is very small, but then I could I could smoothly connect them by making my parameters j and j prime even smaller, and then h this small thing dominates and it will go over the north pole. So I can once once I once I've opened up the possibility that it's not strictly zero and you can tilt things a little bit out of the plane, then we have then essentially we open up we open up you know, what was a a phase transition point becomes a crossover. Uh, well, we can, we can, well, of course, in practice, that crossover might be so sharp that it doesn't matter, but uh, it's no longer, it's, it's no longer a, uh, a phase transition, strictly. Like, okay. you know, a bit like in, you know, in the Ising model, you know, it, or in, in a ferromagnet, if you put on a small symmetry breaking magnetic field, then we'll, you know, strictly there's no, uh, there's no phase transition, so it's all rounded, but if it's small enough, it doesn't really matter. Okay, thank uh, you. Sure. Just a follow-up uh, on, follow on this question. 
can we then just think that the Z phase no longer has to be like zero or pi or two That's pi right. and yeah. can be take continuous yeah. values? Okay. Yeah. So the, the Zach phase itself. So here, I mean, we can this 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 thing in general. This is just some number. You know, if you don't have a if you don't have the symmetry, if you don't have symmetry constraints on U of Q, the Zach phase can take any value you like. It's, and uh, and indeed, if we were to you know think about computing the Zach phase as we go from red to green to blue, it's just going to change smoothly from zero to to minus pi. That's right. So the Zach phase by itself is not is not a is not a quantized. It's, it's it can take any real value. And it's a solid angle of the subtended by h of q, right? Isn't it? So uh, maybe uh, half of it. It uh, maybe, maybe I don't know. I, I, geometrical interpretation. I, I'm not. Uh, well, that's why. Yeah. Anyway, you know. What the Stokes sphere you plotting is for the parameters of this vector h of q. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I the red and the blue are meant to represent the SSH model. The green is just something which okay. you know, I haven't thought much about it. Yeah, I just well, meant you, if you have a magnetic field, if you have a Zeeman field, you know, there's one way is in terms of this. Uh, phase that you wrote that, but the other is you can write it as a this, you know, like punchy eigen index of the n n hat vector that you make out of the spinner. And, well, the, the, and that follows well, that, the field, doesn't it? Well but I think your your the Pontragon index is if you've got a two-dimensional space, we want to integrate that's more of the Berry curvature 2D turn number story, I think. Here we would need to extend our 1D if you want to think about yeah. a solid angle. Well, I mean, generically, like if you have H of Q generically, isn't it in the QX, QY? Yes, I think- oh, okay, sorry, this is 1D. Sorry, you're right, it's 1D. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, here I'm just thinking of 1D, so, so I, I mean- yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, may I have a comment on that? So actually, both of you, are, I think, are correct. If you have a curved surface, this corresponds to the solid angle. I think so it's in one is a bit different. But, so may I also ask a question just to understand the sub-lattice symmetry correctly? So does this mean if you switch the sub-lattice A and B, everything remains the same? So are the H states. So does this correct? So, well, so the... If we switch, it, well, the, the, so, the, I mean, how, how could I uh, uh, in, in intuitively understand the sub lattice symmetry? So that means you can simply switch A and B. Oh. No, the, so the sub the sub lattice symmetry. No, sorry, I, I should I should be I should be more clear. The sub lattice symmetry, or what's referred to the sub lattice symmetry, is essentially that the Hamiltonian is off diagonal in the in an A B basis. So it's the entries, so the only terms in the Hamiltonian, the single particle Hamiltonian, are ones where a particle hops from an A site to a B site. So that's the that that's the, the real symmetry that has this. And you could think of that even in a disordered, you know, here I've written it for for the way of Q, but we could think of it for the you know the original you know, in this original Hamiltonian um, here. If I write down any term where I only couple sites A to site B, then I have this, that's that's what the sublattice symmetry means. So that's the or the chiral symmetry. So so I could, you know, I can I can supplement this with anything I, I like. I could, you know, I could make this, you know, I could make this J prime depend on J. Fine. It's still sublattice symmetry. I can't, I won't have plane waves, but it's 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 off diagonal in this A B basis. So so that, that's the key, that's the key feature. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions as well. Uh, so sure. you mentioned um, HC equals zero, right? But this is also include potentially having an H zero, an identity component. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I, I could, um, I can add to this. Yeah, I could add uh, some uh, uh, overall uh, energy offset or constant. And that's that. That's that won't um, uh, that won't influence the um, 
uh, you know, it, I, if I just put in a constant identity matrix, that of course I can just subtract off as well. So, so the so indeed, you know, the general Hamiltonian I, I can expand also in the poly matrices and the identity. But I've, I've taken the identity away, essentially setting the zero of energy. Okay, thanks. And then uh, are chiral and sublattice symmetries the only ones for which you can expect this non-trivial topology? No, there, there are a whole series. Uh, in the next lecture, I'll, I'll mention there's a, there's a whole. Uh, there, there's essentially uh, the more symmetries you put in, the, the more constraints you have, the, the the more topological phases that can appear. But there is a there's a, a classic set of uh, this uh, altman zernbar classification of, of uh, non-spatial symmetries, which are chiral symmetry, time reversal symmetry, and particle hole symmetry. And this defines 10 classes. And there's you know, one of the triumphs of this field was to, um, to determine the topological indices and classifications of for these 10 different symmetry, symmetry classes uh, in different dimensionalities. But, that's, but that also is not the end of the story because that's a particular set of symmetries and one can, one can go further. So th this is just the tip of the iceberg. And it's really a, a model, a simple, you know, the simplest model uh, which uh, demonstrates the, the notion of topology and also that that topology can be symmetry protected. And the others, you know, the, you know, the other examples are more complicated mathematically, but conceptually they're the same. That you're, you know, if you, you have a, having the symmetry puts a constraint and limits the, the way in, the ways in which the block bands can deform and therefore they cannot and therefore you can have, they can be in topologically distinct sectors, but if you break that symmetry, then those topologically detect, detect sectors then can, can, can merge with each other, just as this, this red and green can merge through the, so red and blue can merge through the green trajectory if you break the kind of symmetry. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank question. you. That's uh, important, yeah. Okay, let's see. So I, I, um, uh, I think, Maybe in the last ten minutes, I, I, so I wanted to talk about edge states. So, so one of the the, the key, the key uh, feature of this. So, I want to you know, talk about physical consequences. And edge states, uh, and uh, you know, we're here we're thinking about the situ situation where we've got, you know, our SSH bands, and we're. You know, we make a band insulator, we, we put one fermion per, per unit cell, and so we get a band insulator. Um, so it's, you know, that means that there's a gap in the bulk. So if we want to make an excitation in the bulk, we have to move a fermion from the filled state to empty state, and there's definitely a gap there, because that's, uh, you know, we haven't let the band gap close, uh, but it has, uh, it can have, um, uh, uh, gapless, uh, gapless surface state as a gapless, at least in the topological phase. And uh, you can demonstrate this directly just in this model. It's rather nice that you can just solve exactly for the um, surface state for a semi infinite chain where I'll just think of a chain where I have you know, my A site and B site, that was, that was the, what I defined as a unit cell, would have an A and a B in, in the unit cell J of one, which were connected by some coupling J prime, and then they were coupling, connected by coupling J to the next unit cell, which had an A and a B, uh, and so on. And this is unit cell J plus two, and so on. And we can, we want to think about the surface state to a vacuum, but actually it's helpful conceptually to think of you know, this uh, as being connected to you know, a system which is still A and B, you know, it's still the system I had before, A, B, and so on with, with J prime, J prime, but here I set J equal to zero. So just J of zero means that they're, they're just disconnected. So, you know, so everything, you know, everything over here I could just ignore it. It's just a vacuum, but I put it in conceptually because it's really, we really look at the interface between a state 
um, with you know, j prime j on the right and with j equals zero and j prime on the left. Uh, and uh, so this, you know, in the, uh, what we discussed, this was a case where phi zac was zero, it was the non-topological case, right? Because j was less than j prime, and uh, yeah, so they, you didn't encircle the origin. And uh, so you can solve this exactly. So the, the set of equations, just uh, if I write them out, without too much uh, thought, but you know, the, the amplitude, now we're doing the equations in real space. So the amplitude on site j, so um, yeah, phi psi i on site j, um, if, if j is greater than one, uh, then you know, it changes due to hopping from the amplitude of the, sorry, on the B site from the same unit cell. So that would be hopping from B to A um, or minus J times phi B at J minus one. So this is if J is greater than one, J equals two and so on. Or if it's, the, if it's just this site, there's one special one, which is that it has an interface to the vacuum. There's no hopping from the left-hand side. So in this case, it just gets minus J prime psi B of J, and then J equals one. So, so the, this is just what the, the, the Schrodinger, the, the time independent Schrodinger equation will be uh, for the ACE, for the, the right-hand side, um, uh, for the A sites. And for the B sites, uh, well, all the B sites uh, get hopping from to the left and from the right, uh, and so this one, and so it's, it's a bit simpler than we just write. Minus J prime phi A of J minus J psi A J plus one. So, uh, okay, so that's, um, that's the set of equations we have to solve. Uh, and well, I, I'll, uh, well, maybe just, you know, you're encouraged to do some uh, exercises, maybe as an exercise, uh, you could check, uh, show there is a zero energy state. There's a solution here with exactly zero energy, which has the following form. So I J, you know, these amplitudes, the A and the B site uh, are proportional to um, minus J prime over J to the power of J and zero. So this, so this is a state, so J prime over J, if J prime over J is less than one, then that raised to, so there are too many J's here, I'm sorry, there's li little J is the site index. And as the site index increases, then um, the amp this amplitude will decay exponentially if j prime over j is less than one. So we get a normalizable state and that is our edge state. So we have a state which is normalizable for j prime over j less than one. But if j prime over j is greater than one, then it grows exponentially. It's not a normalizable state and it's not a localized edge state. So this uh, is precisely an explicit uh, uh, solution or a demonstration of the uh, zero energy edge state in, in the topological case. And here, remember, J prime over J was the condition that we had the topological phase or the condition that the Zach phase was different from the, the, the Zach phase to the left. But we were, um, it also has this feature um, that the energy is exactly zero. Well, it's just, it's uh, uh, mathematical, but, uh, but it will be, it will um, remain exactly zero provided the symmetry is respected. And what I mean by that is that if we were to, you know, we've solved it precisely for this uh, uh, idealized model, but if we were to put in some disorder or some modulation or something that meant that the couplings J and J prime were not uniform, or if it didn't just drop from J is non-zero to J is zero immediately, but it changed slowly, provided the, um, uh, 
provided the sublattice symmetry is preserved, that is that you know, the, the Hamiltonian is entirely off diagonal, then the zero energy state cannot move away from zero. It's topologically protected. Whereas if we were in a um, topological, in a, um, we could have, you know, generically, we can have edge states on some insulators. Those can appear. Um, there's no reason, you know, a subgap state in some insulator doesn't really mean anything, you know, necessarily topological. It could just be some particular bound state. But here, the special thing is that there's a state that's exactly in the middle of the gap. And if you perturb it in any way, it doesn't move away. And there's a, a way to, um, to you know, I'm making strong uh, statements, but I, I leave it uh, uh, in view of time. I'll put it up as, a, as an uh, exercise uh, for, um, uh, that essentially shows that, which is to show that if you have, if the Hamiltonian uh, is such that it um, anti-commutes with this operator sigma z, then the energy spectrum is exactly symmetric under energy goes to minus energy. So, so this is, you know, if you can prove that, then what I just said is uh, will, will follow because, um, uh, so what I said, I wrote it down, head state is robust to symmetry preserving the conditions. Uh, and the, um, you know, the, the way to think of that is that if we think in terms of energy, here's zero energy. And if I look at the, you know, plot something like the density of states, then, you know, the, the, the bands, you know, I've got some states here but, you know, and some states here, and it has to be exactly symmetric around zero. So if I have a state which appears exactly at zero in, you know, in this idealized model, we just find it is exactly zero, then if we preserve the symmetry, we can't move that away from zero because if we moved it to the right, then it would break this exact uh, symmetry of the spectrum under E to minus E. So the fact that this, that this, um, that this constraint enforces the spectral, uh, sym the spectral symmetry uh, ensures that, the, um, that any perturbations that respect that symmetry will keep this, this gap, this uh, gapless state precisely in the middle of the gap. And I guess it's important that it's, it's not doubly degenerate because you rejected one of the, the other yeah. state. Yeah. So here, yeah, you know, good, good point. Thanks, Leo. So yeah, if there were two states here, then they, of course they can split. But I, uh, the, the way things have been set up, we only looked at one edge. If we look at, we looked at the left-hand edge, there is also a state far on the right-hand edge. You know, if we were to study the full system with, you know, with open boundary conditions, but I've set up a problem uh, which is just semi-infinite. And then there's only one state here and it can't move away. Now, in practice, if we, you know, if we have a finite system, there could be some uh, tunnel coupling between these that are really two states, but that's, uh, that splitting is exponentially suppressed and provided, provided the decay length of these bound states is much smaller than the, um, than the spatial extent, then uh, that's exponentially suppressed and um, will be uh, negligible. So, yeah, thanks. So, so indeed here, uh, I've set up a problem where there is only one, and there's only one edge, then, then this is enough to ensure that it's, um, that it's stable. What happens if you have periodic boundaries or do you join the two edges? So if, if, there, if, there are, if it's periodic, um, preserving the symmetry, then you really just, you have just one chain, there's no interface, and then there are no bound states, it's just, it's entirely gapped. And, and in fact, you know, the solution, the block wave solutions I wrote down, are the solutions in that case. There's no, you know, we can, once it's, if it's truly periodic, then we can just say we have these block waves on a, you know, on a dense mesh of, you know, spacing two pi over L of, of the wave vector. And that's all there is. There are no bound states because there's no interface. Now, you, if you do something, you could do something tricky where you had something periodic, and, but you put a, an inter, you know, interface, you have a region which is, you know, A, B, A, B, and then you change, or, or J, J prime is, um, J over J prime is less than one, and J over J prime is more than one. So you could, but you'll generate two interfaces, you'll generate two interfaces on the ring, and so you'll get two bond states at these two points. Um, yeah, thanks. But do I understand it correctly then, then if I have it on a periodic system that you don't have any topological feature at all? 
Uh, uh, that is right. So there is no, for that, there, there is no, um, just in the spectrum, or, I mean, you, you can look for, uh, if you just look at the ground states and the spectrum of the system, there is no, um, you know, that by itself is not topological. That's okay, thanks. Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Of course, please. Yeah. But still, the, the bulk will be uh, topological, right? So even though like it's periodic, it's, it will be still topological, no? So, so you say again, what, what will still be topological? So if, if we think about the periodic, yes, there will be no edge states, but uh, the, the state, like the phase still will be topological, right? Because yeah. uh, the invariant, topological invariant will be non-zero. Exactly. Yeah, so, so, so this is a, so, so it's a, um, so this is the, you know, the subtlety or slight difficulty with this, you know, mapping to this SSH model that the, 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 you know, the physical, uh, manifestation of the um, uh, of the topology is a is in at the interface or comparing two different two different um, ratios of j over j prime. So we can you know, we can surely we, you know, we can still compute or measure let's say the um, the Zach phase or for for that system, and you can get a, a number out. But actually, that number whether it's pi or zero will depend on your on how you've chosen your unit cell. And it's really, um, so the, by itself, it doesn't have a clear physical consequence. And so I would, um, um, I would not assign a topological character to it um, because it's the, the, its value itself is, it is dependent on a, a gauge choice of the system. Now, there can be, um, particular, you know, the particular choices can be relevant if you ask certain physical questions. And here there was a particular physical question, which was where we had a, a boundary between A and B, where we terminated it on this bond uh, here, rather than terminating it on the one that was inside our unit cell. And that's why in this case, um, our notion of phi zac of zero was non-topological and phi zac of minus pi was topological. That's why that worked. But if we're really, you know, strictly, if we're really in the periodic system and we've got no reason to, to uh, choose one bond over the other, uh, it's by itself, it, it doesn't, I'm not aware of any topological features that we can assign to it. So I, so I, I, I would, um, um, so, I, so I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't view it as topological in itself. It's only with, re with reference to these, this interface or this difference between these two these two uh, these two uh, classes. So Wait, let me. Uh, can I? Can, but what would happen if I then tuned the ratio j per j prime over j in this periodic setting? I mean, would 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 I drive some sort of transition with that? Well, it's. Uh, in the periodic setting, we can just go back to the block waves, and we you know if J, it's we will have a band insulator as long as J prime over J is not one. But once it's one, there's a band there's a band touching and it reopens. So we can so we can make a you know we can make a transition to a a, a semi metal. You know at, at J prime over J is one, the, the, the insulator becomes a semi metal, and locally it has a sort of a one D Dirac type dispersion, and then it opens again, uh, and and the the you know the property you know the the nature of the wave functions has changed and the description has changed to some extent but but we have to if you want to look for physically measurable uh, quantities then you have to be um, have to be careful as to what you're looking for to, to see any you know I'm not sure you'd see anything um, in just static measurements of that that would necessarily say that one is topological you know, that they're, they're different. You know, they're, but they're not, um, they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're edge states, for example. Polarization will be different, oh. right? The, the polar, you can define a polarization for it. I mean, of course, SSH is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, weird because it's a really topologically abstracted system. But generally speaking, um, I think that's a whole notion of the bulk invariant is that you could, uh, 
in, for example, in 3D TI, you can, uh, you know, somehow connect it to some magnet, magnetic response, uh, magnetic transport response. Yeah, so, so the, polariz indeed, the polarization you can define, but you have to, the polarization you know, is, is, um, is not defined up, up to additions of integers. Sure. And, yeah. and, and we, um, we, we have to have some, if, if, we, if we make some change or something periodic or, or change the polarization of time and let the exact phase change, that, then, we, then we can start seeing something which does tell us you know, about, um, that the system has some intrinsic um, topology. But just, just I, I'm taking it as a pure statement, just look at the static properties and then and look at the energy spectrum by itself. Um, the, the, the two, J over J prime, greater than one or less than one, you can, I can always trade off by just, by just swapping what I mean by A or B. Mm -hmm. so, so, it's, um, so in the bulk uniform case, that, that uh, should be physically um, not, uh, not relevant. Can I ask a very brief question? So this is uh, very similar to Kitab chain. Um, I don't know if you're going to talk about that, but can you elaborate on the differences, if there's any difference? I mean, I know the symmetry is different. And also one is a topological insulator, other one superconductor, but like conceptually, is there any so, difference? Um, well, conceptually, I mean, I mean, they're very, very similar mathematically, but different in detail because you know, the, sym the symmetry is a particle hole symmetry that comes about from the superconductivity. Um, and so, but uh, there's a, there's a, there is a practical difference that this, the Bobby Roof de Jean Hamiltonian, that symmetry is not something that one can break. It's, it's, not, it's probably, it's wrong to call it a symmetry, it's really a redundancy. That Bobby Roof de Jean Hamiltonian, the spectrum comes paired plus E and minus E because um, uh, because you're described with creation and annihilation operators of fermions, and so there's no you've got no freedom to say I'm going to spoil that uh, by hand. It's 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 hardwired. So that that's one difference. So that's it's more robust in that sense if you're in this superconducting phase. And the other aspect is that this the edge mode is or this zero energy mode is a uh, so-called Majorana fermion because you're mixing particles and holes. Whereas here we just have a we have a regular electron, it's a bound state of an electron, but, but the key difference, again, the, the difference, you know, mathematically, they look the same. There's something like sigma z that describes the particle hole transformation, and you have exact symmetry of the spectrum, and it would be pinned at zero. So all of that looks the same. In detail, it's different because the symmetry is different, and it's, it's, it's because it's this um, mixing of particles and holes. I, I will say a little bit more, but uh, if I have time. I, I realize that I'm very close to the end, or I'm at the end of the time. I, I, um, I thought. I mean, I, I had a, a couple more things I might say, but but I just just to conclude, I, I you know very briefly, just to put up um, you know to make some contact to Cold Adams, just to put up some uh, realizations of this SSH model that have been implemented. Um, so the, you know the natural thing to do is to make directly this optical super lattice with. With contrapropagating beams that give standing waves of uh, one lattice constant and twice the lattice constant, and if you tune them carefully and the, and the offsets, you can make um, uh, uh, potential of the type that I showed. And uh, that was done in, in Munich, and they they did a beautiful experiment where they used rubidium atoms to measure the Zach phase difference under the two different, the, you know, whether J or J prime. But which was bigger, J or J prime? So they, they, they measured the, the Zach phase in one case, the Zach phase in the other, and they took the difference. And that's a nice, clear measurement of the, um, of the properties of the bands, and it gives you this gauge invariant quantity, uh, which is the phase difference. Um, it's also been used for pumping, which I'll say more about uh, later, um, um, where you um, uh, modulate the positions in, uh, of these um, in, in time. Uh, there's also a nice uh, implementation, which is not in real space at all, but in momentum space, where um, you take a B C, you know, around momentum zero, and then use um, two photon coupling to get it kicks um, by multiples of h bar k, and by tuning 
you know, by separately controlling all of the possible kicks on, on the energy dispersion, of, you know, then um, they were able to actually uh, make essentially a momentum space lattice up to 21 lattice sites where the sites are really momentum states and they could put a, a defect between two different dynamizations and directly measure the head state. And, and one other uh, related um, to topic I'd like to point out, which was uh, mentioned, I think, by Antoine Browse uh, last week in his talks, uh, uh, was the beautiful experiment on Rydberg atoms and tweezer arrays, where they make something that is a uh, uh, looks like an SSH model. There's hopping of J prime and J on, on the ladder. It's all tuned, so it's it's there's a sub lattice hopping. There's no direct hopping between the A and the A sites. Beautifully uh, realized. But uh, what's um, uh, even more uh, interesting is that this is not for non-interacting bosons or non-interacting fermions. It's for very strongly interacting bosons, hardcore bosons, and it also realizes a topological phase which is distinct from the SSH phase because that's for weakly interacting fermions. This is for strongly interacting bosons, but it also turns out that that has a, um, in the appropriate regime, it has a, um, uh, it, it has a gapless edge state and they were able to, uh, they were able to detect it uh, spectroscopically directly. So uh, that's, uh, that's, I'll just highlight here, there's some, um, there's some uh, spectral weight in the topological phase on zero, which is the measurement of the edge state in the, in the two edges. Okay, with, with that, since time's up, I, I, I stop there and just put up a summary. So I gave, tried to give a, a, an introduction to the topology of uh, um, topological energy bands by thinking about 1D system and the Zach phase, where if we have the sublattice symmetry um, and this periodicity of the Hamiltonian, we could show that the, the Zach phase is minus pi times a winding number and uh, I showed how that works for the SSH model and uh, how you get a, this symmetry protected uh, gapless edge state uh, at the equal zero. So uh, uh, I'll stop there. I'm happy to take more questions, but um, I realize that it's been uh, an yeah. time. but uh, thanks a lot. No, that's fantastic, Nigel. And you had a lot of questions during the, during the session. So uh, thank you so much. And I think unless there are very urgent questions, I then encourage all of you to go to the poster session and enjoy, uh, try to see as much posters as you can. And well, there is another two lectures for from Nigel that uh, we can continue um, asking. Does that make sense? Excellent. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Thank you. See you Thanks, tomorrow. Sarah.